Barbie doll sticking out of the window, or is that? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> like... <laughs> and a cake. And what? A birthday cake. Oh yes. Yeah. With light ice. Light ice. Why are there different shades of ice? Oh my what god, my, the... my stomach you... is turning already. Are Here. you gonna shit? <laughs> I don't know. from you, Matthew. Taking 55 Vicodin a day, you've been in detox over 65 times, first time at age 26. Uh, there are also, within this book, incredibly fun stories about backstage at, at Friends and other parts of your career. But it's also a really, it's a story of a really singular childhood and a life as an actor. Um, and we'll cover all of that tonight, but what was it that made you think now was the time to write the book? Uh, well, I, the, the main answer to that is that I felt very secure in my sobriety. And that was the first time in a long time. It took very hard work to, to get there. write a book like this and then, you know, appear drunk at your local bar. <laughs> so, that would also get covered, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of the ways that it helped was I was on this great job. And I had the best job in the world. I, I would constantly say I was like the second baseman on the Yankees. I had this great job that I couldn't mess up. So it would calm it down a little bit. But, and the other good thing was I had the money to pay for help. Um, but an incredible amount of money. And I'm like not getting the right help. But I spent millions of dollars trying to get sober. And it's not an exaggeration. Um, so the job and the money did help. One of the things I say in the book is when you're making a million dollars a week, you can't have the 17th drink. You know? You have to calm it down a little bit so you don't and I had a rule that I would never drink or take drugs while I was working and that was basically born out of the respect that I had for the other five actors but I just barely got through that and I would work extremely hungover and so you know I was basically it was like I was drinking at work because I was just my head was screaming all the time I want to dive into friends a little bit but I know that I can, I can help people and if I do it publicly, sort of like I've done now, uh, there's not, there hasn't been that many books written from the addict and from the addict's point of view. And again, I get back to that thing that I said a few minutes ago, which was, you, you, everybody isn't touched by this disease, just things just stop, just stop, yeah. just stop. And you can't, you, you can't, it's a, it's an obsession of your, it's two-pronged disease. It's an obsession of your mind and an allergy of your body. So what happens is you think about a martini and then all you can think about is a martini. You can't think of anything, you can't, oh, I'm on Friends, I gotta have a martini. I, I, gotta have, I can't think of anything other than a martini. So you ultimately do the insane, <clears throat> which is insane, um, it's, and I'm insane, I'm definitely insane, but only in this area, you know. 
Um, so you break the bond of sobriety and you drink the martini. And what happens to your body is it says, oh, okay, now you've, now you've drank the martini, now you've got to drink everything you've ever drank and more today, now, right now. At 2 o'clock in the morning, you've got to race across town to try to get a bottle of vodka so you can drink it at home or you're screwed. You know, so that's, that's the, how confusing and cunning and baffling and powerful this disease is. It's, that once we got back to the stage, you could hear people's dreams coming true. You could hear, it was like a popping sound. It was like pop, pop, pop. You could hear everybody's dreams come true. As we walked to our cars, and as we knew we'd get to drive there the next day, and Jim Burroughs was the best director in town, and he was directing it. And, you know, you had the best writers, the, the, luckily the best cast, magic was happening. And uh, it, cur it certainly curtailed my driving, or my driving, my drinking. <laughs> <laughs> when you have a big cash, you're not allowed to drive. <laughs> <laughs> and tell us, you, Chandler speak. Yeah. Could I, could I be more annoying? Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember your first Chandler speak on the show? Uh, I think it was, could it be any hotter in here? <laughs> <laughs> that started when you were a kid. Yeah, the started Murray with brother. the Murray brothers. Because you, you know, in the book you write about this sort of long, simmering crush on Jennifer Aniston. Mm -hmm. And Julia, my coach, became very concerned that during the Friends reunion, when David Schwimmer and Aniston started talking about their little flame, that you were seething with anger. <laughs> oh, I knew. I saw it happening. They would cuddle right on the stage. I was like, are you guys kidding? And Jennifer, you, you clearly don't like me. <laughs> you write one, I think it was season four or something, where you were, you were in very good shape. Yeah. Or you, were, so you were clean and... You said uh, you looked really good. Still not good enough for Jennifer Aniston, but pretty fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That if someone needs help, you will be the first one there. A lot of people who are famous will not stick around after an AA meeting because they, for understandably, don't want to give their number out. You're not one of those people. Your door is open to people. Um, Hi, Vlog. I look terrible, and I'm just, it's a week after this was filmed. Um, I'm laying down on the couch, but I was editing, and I realized I had recorded, like, a whole snippet of when we were sitting in the Starbucks drive through me and my mom, like, explaining where we were going, and I don't know what happened to that, and then I recorded the next morning talking about the show and saying some stuff that I wanted to say disappeared as well, lost footage, so, and I don't have my camera, but I really wanted to just edit this video, so, I'm coming in here to say, so me and my mom went to go see, Matthew Perry came out with a book called Friends, Lovers, and the Big Terrible Thing, and he talks about his addiction and recovery, and it's a really incredible book, I have like 100 pages left, you should definitely read it and check it out, but what I wanted to say was that, so me and my mom love Friends, I grew up watching Friends, she watched Friends while she was pregnant with me, so I would say, like, I literally came out of the womb loving Friends, like, I have just always loved it. As a kid, I didn't get the jokes, they were adult jokes, but I would laugh so hard, like, I love Friends. Obviously, I'm not the only person in the world that loves Friends, the show is huge, but, so we always love, we always love Friends, and my mom is in recovery, um, I'm not spilling the beans here, she's very open about it, um, she knows that I am talking about it, like, it's okay. Um, but she's in recovery, and as a child of an addict and someone that had a pretty rough upbringing, um, for obvious reasons, we, there have been times in my life where my mom and I didn't talk for many, many years. Um, it would be periods of months and then years and stuff, and now is the longest time that she's been sober, and we have, I've been through therapy, still going through it. I've been in therapy since I was nine years old, but um, my point is that all I'm trying to say here, the video just froze while I was recording, I don't know why, um, anyway, we have 
been working on our relationship um, and rebuilding a relationship, a friendship, and it was really special for me to be able to go with her because even when her and I weren't speaking, I never, like, I've always loved Friends, and while it always reminded me of her because we would watch it together and we loved it so much, um, it was always my comfort show. So there would be times like looking back to when her and I weren't speaking and I would watch it, it would remind me of her and it would remind me of her in a good way, even though I was still hurting and I wasn't ready to speak with her. But it was really special to be able to go with her because she's in, I'm proud of her for her growth and I'm proud of us for being able to go together. Um, so it was really special for me to go and I didn't record the whole thing. It was an, at an hour talk show. And I recorded, I put in the vlog what I recorded, and then I recorded some things on my phone, but I didn't want to record the whole time, like, I really was just enjoying being present, and it was a lot of fun, and I wanted to make more videos, um, talking about being the child of an addict, um, and it's not to take away from the addict story, it's just that I feel like not a lot of people really talk about that and what it does to your mental and even physical health. Um, and not yet healed, but I am healing. And healing is not linear. But this is a safe space, and even if it helps nobody, if it helps just one person, if anybody could relate to anything that I said, then it's worth it. Otherwise, I'm just making an ass out of myself, but I hope you enjoyed the vlog, and yeah. Okay, still in editing, still looking rough, but I just needed to say that I met a girl that was sitting next to me. Her name was Abby. She's from New York. That's all I know about this girl. She was super sweet. We talked. We waited outside for Matthew Perry together after, but she turned around and she took a 0.5x zoom picture. And I was in it, I was standing right next to her so we could have Matthew on the stage. Only selfie I'll ever get with Matthew Perry. I forgot to have her, like, text it to me, airdrop it to me. I made a TikTok trying to reach her. I can't find her. I've been going through Matthew Perry's tagged photos every day trying to see if she would post it. Please, Abby from New York, if you, if you happen to see this, please, please send me the picture. Please, it was so nice to meet you and all I want is that picture with Matthew Perry. I don't know what else to do.